A reporter once dismissed my medical practice saying, you know stress can't kill you, right? I had a word with him about how things like the broken heart syndrome or metastatic cancer or complications from surgery here can in fact kill you and they can come from stress. So let's set the record straight with the top three mental health myths that gaslight my patients and delay their diagnoses and treatment. And this is gonna be based off of what I see in patients under anesthesia who are struggling with depression, anxiety, or PTSD, and what happens to their bodies when they're under anesthesia. The first myth around depression, people just aren't trying hard enough to be happy. Under anesthesia, people with depression's bodies act differently. It's not always super obvious, but their subconscious is processing pain, trauma, and medications differently. And I don't think they're just not trying hard enough under anesthesia. Their brain-body physiology, including pain signaling, autonomic tone, and stress hormone output really does behave differently under the knife and when connected to the ventilator. That's why anesthesiologists may use different anesthesia techniques or drugs or doses or post-operative pain strategies in patients with major depressive disorder. Here are some concrete examples. Depressed patients may have higher pain thresholds and need different medications during surgery. On the flip side, patients with anxiety may have a lower pain threshold during surgery and might need more pain medications. And these observations have been seen in patients who are not medicated for their mental health conditions, suggesting that the psychiatric medications are not affecting the brain and body in these observations in patients having surgery. It really may be related to the physical effects of depression and anxiety. That being said, patients with depression tend to have higher pain thresholds during surgery, but have higher post-operative pain medication requirements when they wake up. Self-loathing, in particular, also is consistent with higher post-operative pain requirements, such as longer opioid requirement, which might put them at risk for opioid dependence or other complications after surgery, even though these patients might not need as much pain medication during surgery. And this can be confusing to doctors who aren't aware of this phenomenon because they may have lower pain medication requirements during the surgery itself. Depression is also linked with a higher rate of postoperative delirium, which itself is related to many complications, including postoperative cognitive deficits. I have a whole video on that. Check it out. It's linked below. So let's squash this one, because as an anesthesiologist, I can firmly attest to the neurobiological changes that happen in folks with depression when they're unconscious under anesthesia with the changes in connectivity between key parts of their brain, like their amygdala and prefrontal cortex. You can and should try your hardest to heal your mental health conditions, but depression does not just come from a lack of effort. Here's myth number two. Anxiety is just being high strung or nervous. It's not a real medical condition. Anxiety produces objective hormone driven changes in our cardiovascular function, our immune system functioning and our wound healing. Treating anxiety is not coddling patients. It's evidence-based medicine that improves surgical outcomes and long-term brain and heart health. For example, high trait anxiety individuals, or what we colloquially call people with type A personalities, have a different stress response to surgery, specifically as it relates to key hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. And that anxiety can impact your immune system, which orchestrates your wound healing, which is a critical part of your surgical recovery. Because the faster your wounds heal, the less pain you'll be in, and the faster you'll get back to living life. So it's not surprising that psychological stress and anxiety can impact surgical complications and delayed recovery. Patients with anxiety before surgery are at risk of having complications with their sleep, which can absolutely impact how quickly they recover and impact their overall surgical outcome. Anxiety also appears to be related to endothelial cell dysfunction, or what we might call spazzy blood vessels. Because when the cells that line these blood vessels are not properly relaxing and contracting, it can lead to heart problems like heart attacks and strokes. And this is a serious concern for women specifically who may have a lower risk of atherosclerotic heart disease, but are still at risk of heart attacks. Another important concept that many women get gaslit for. From guiding tens of thousands of patients through anesthesia, IV ketamine experiences, and stellate ganglion blocks, I can absolutely tell you that there are physical changes with anxiety in our bodies. And they are absolutely measurable and related to heart rate, 
blood pressure, and cortisol levels. And these responses don't only impact how the body processes anesthesia when you're unconscious, but also impacts your long-term health, both physically and psychologically. By the way, if you're learning something new, please share what you're learning with your loved ones and hit that like button. And remember that you can learn more by visiting my San Francisco Clinic's website at claris-health.com. Moving on to myth number three. PTSD is something you can just get over with time. Therapy and medical treatments are just for people who can't figure it out themselves. I'm shocked people still believe this. PTSD leaves durable, long-lasting changes to your neurobiology in your brain, brainstem, and spinal cord. The fingerprints of PTSD affect our pain, our risk of heart attacks and strokes, and even post-surgical complications. So it's far from a set it and forget it medical condition. For example, Patients with PTSD have smaller brain volumes in the hippocampus, a key brain region involved in memory storage and consolidation. Patients with PTSD, especially combat veterans, have disrupted communication between key brain regions involving emotion and memory, like between the amygdala, hippocampus, and insular cortex. Cerebrospinal fluid from patients with PTSD contains higher concentrations of corticotropin-releasing hormone, which ultimately leads to higher cortisol levels, and cortisol is that stress hormone that can wreak havoc all over your body. Patients with PTSD are also at higher risk of post-operative delirium, a condition where patients might be kicking or screaming or biting others and putting themselves at risk, or the medical staff around them, all unconsciously. And like I said earlier, in patients with depression, postoperative delirium is associated with many surgical complications, including postoperative cognitive deficits. And it's not just here in the operating room because both men and women with PTSD are at higher risk of heart attacks and strokes, underscoring just how tightly linked our brain and heart health are. So let's put this PTSD myth to rest. There are deep cutting changes to our neurobiology with PTSD. They include things like dysfunctional hyperarousal or memory consolidation and changes in our stress response. And these are so noticeable that your doctor in the operating room might change your medication so that you can undergo surgery more safely and comfortably if you've had PTSD before. So we've debunked some popular myths, but there are some myths that are also true. And I'm not just talking about things like the broken heart syndrome where yes, people with significant stressors like grief can rarely develop heart failure and eventually die from it. Nor am I referring to the effects of chronic stress that might facilitate metastatic expansion of certain cancers. I'm referring to some subconscious mysteries that affect both people with and without mental health conditions like the effects of repeating positive affirmations through headphones on patients in induced medical comas here in the operating room who might wake up with less pain and less nausea after surgery. Because remember, anesthesia is a medical coma. We think the brain is turned off, but it's still processing audio stimuli that are coming in. It sounds crazy, but it's absolutely been documented. I call it the Dr. Strange effect. And I'll share a personal story that also opened my mind up to the incredible processing of our subconscious brain. I once had a patient who almost died on the operating room table in a medical emergency. Fortunately, they woke up, but the first thing they asked me was, did I die? Even though she was completely unconscious throughout the entire crisis. It's crazy, my hands were almost shaking thinking of what had been going on in that patient's brain when they were supposedly unconscious during the surgery. These all demonstrate that your brain and body are more tightly linked than we currently understand in modern medicine. And it also suggests that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. Let me know what you think in the comments below and be sure to subscribe to keep up with all of my videos. And remember to visit my clinic's website at claris-health.com to learn more about the hidden mysteries of healing in the subconscious brain.